Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 41 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. This is part two of my interview with Shane Partlow. Shane, as you may recall, is a former non-commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps, an assistant attaché in the U.S. Defense Attaché Office at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine, from 2011 until 2014. During the tumultuous events of 2014, which led to the fall of the Ukrainian government, Shane was at ground zero, reporting back to the U.S. government minute by minute as protests grew, as government forces cracked down, and eventually as Russian troops suddenly and unexpectedly occupied parts of the country, and his mission changed from observing a revolution to observing a Russian invasion. Let's continue to listen to the rest of my interview with Shane now. So when you were out there, were you roving around with a buddy from the office, or were you just on your own, just going where you needed to go? It depends. Some days you're by yourself. Black Sunday was definitely, you know, the first part out there. We weren't together. We were both on the square, but we were, you know, we couldn't see each other. We were on opposite sides mm. covering the events. But after that, the battle buddy system was definitely something we followed after that. That makes sense. We I was going to we say, I mean, it's, it sounds like you're at a point where you need some support from somebody from the office there of one kind or another in case anything happens. Of course, if you'd been uh, injured more severely, yeah. you know, with, without anybody it's, with you, that would have been really... And a major incident. Yeah. Yep, for sure. You know, and that's it's it's a double edged sword at times. You know, sometimes you want to blend in, sometimes you stick out, depending on who you're with. So, you know, I certainly did my part to look like I belong there. I won't name names, but there are some people who would go out there as if they were just out for a quick walk from the office to the coffee shop to go back to the office. Hmm dress shoes and slacks and all, and not to stand out there for eight hours straight in 15 degree mm. weather. So it depends. <laughs> so some days it may have been better to be by yourself than with a buddy, depending on who the buddy was. That totally makes sense. It does sound like you could, with your language skills and everything, you could probably blend in a little better than some others, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I can't, by no means could I carry on a conversation with somebody more than two sentences and have them believe I was Ukrainian, but I could mumble. I could give some simple answers and it would be believable that I did belong there. And I got a little story for that <laughs> as well. Well, but. yeah, I definitely want to hear it. But before we go on, I want to take a moment to fill you guys in on the newest tool that I'm wearing and carrying in daily life. It's the Donovan non-metallic knife from Black Triangle. If you aren't familiar with Black Triangle, then you're really missing out. I love these guys because they put the dagger in cloak and dagger. If you've been following me for a while now, then you probably already know why Black Triangle has called their newest non-metallic knife the Donovan. It's named after General William Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Under Donovan, the OSS was unconventional, unexpected, and highly effective, just like Black Triangle's tools. The Donovan is manufactured here in the United States, is made entirely of G10 composite, and comes with a thermoplastic sheath and a couple of amazing extras, which you'll have to see for yourself. You can find it at blacktriangle.com. That's B-L-K triangle.com. You can also get 15% off your first order with Black Triangle using the discount code SPYCRAFT101 or by navigating to blacktriangle.com slash SPYCRAFT101. Wow. I love mine, and I know you're going to love yours too. So, Shane, you said you had a story about that? Yeah, there was quite a few incidents where, you know, you would you would definitely want to not have your presence be known that you were either embassy staff, American, and maybe a buddy would would potentially compromise that. But there was yeah, there was one event. I mean, it was probably somewhere in mid to to late January, maybe even very early February. And the Party of Regions, which was the ruling power of Yanukovych, there was an actual communist party there still with, with membership. But the Party of Regions was kind of seen as the closest successor to the communist party that, you know, obviously you can't really continue on as the communist party after the fall of the Soviet Union with real legitimacy. So the Party of Regions kind of became that, the more modern party line for 
uh, hardcore communists slash authoritarian uh, type political leaders. So that party was holding a rally, maybe a half mile, maybe three quarters of a mile from the downtown area of Kiev. And, you know, we, we decided to go over there and, and have a little look and you could get in there. It was open, you know, it wasn't necessarily checking IDs to get in, but it was, it was a very narrow passageway to get in and a lot of police presence watching people as they come in. So that was one area where, yeah, I felt it absolutely necessary to go in solo and to not be kind of compromised by someone else. Just going around dressed in all black, mumbling about. There was a lot of lot of drinking going on in there. <laughs> um, a lot of old people, pensioners, and a lot of waving of the Soviet flag. Uh, a lot of chanting of old Soviet songs, and a very like overall just depressing mood. I'm sure some of the reports I wrote were, were just about as colorful as the uh, passage I just read to you, but I don't currently have any of those available that have gone through review. It was quite a somber mood at the party of regions rally and just getting around in a deep mumble that kind of, if you're a uh, Ukrainian or Russian of kind of that mindset, that's kind of how you speak anyway, very, very uh, consistent in Russian language. And if you, if you believe you're above someone else in a class kind of com competition, you mumble your words and you kind of speak them in a tone that's really hard to understand. Hmm. So in those situations, you could kind of get by. Because people would just think that you were one of the Tatushka <laughs> and you were just there to kind of grab a quick drink, grab a refreshment before you head back out and cause some ruckus on the other side of town. So that was the way to blend in. And I got another one, <laughs> sure. a different part of the, the country later on, but we'll see if we have time. Sure. Well, I wanted to ask you next. I know that the protests lasted for several months, but eventually it escalated to the point where the police toward the very end, the Berkut, were switched to live rounds eventually. And I know that was like a, a horrible kind of culmination of this riot. Can you talk about what led to that and what happened that particular day? Yeah. So it was not the bear coup. Ah. That's all I can say. It's similar to what had happened in December. Black Sunday happened. There was some definite bouts of violence back and forth that continued through January, that continued into early February. There was increasing kidnappings. The Ukrainian security services would kidnap kind of a leader of the movement and interrogate them for hours, beat them with an inch of their life. And then they would either escape or they'd be left for dead. And there was a great story of someone who was left for dead in a forest, but survived and crawled out. Oh my gosh. And yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty horrendous. Some of the actions that the government was taking to attempt to suppress the protest. And if you remember at the time there was the winter, the Olympic winter games were happening in Sochi. Russia was hosting mm -hmm. and Yanukovych went. So he was there meeting a sitting, you know, photographed in public view in the, the box with, with Putin. So you can take that for what it's worth, but that was happening in about the, the second week of, of February. And our kind of observation, had, you know, really kind of taken a back seat, as you could see in, in, you know, public news sources, the, the revolution at that time was was calming down a bit. The The daily numbers in the crowd were lowering. Around that time, we had a lot of visitors too. Senator McCain came and visited and with a small delegation. And I believe the the population on the square, when he came out, now that he stood up on the stage for a minute, it was up over 50,000. But it was getting a bit more diplomatic at this time. You would have seen also, in, if you're familiar with the Netflix docu- special winter on fire. Yeah. I saw that recently. Um, in, yeah. So in there you'll see Victoria Newland, who at the time was assistant secretary of state for Eurasia or your, whatever the term state department uses for the Eurasian region. She held that position and she was out visiting Kiev and, and I was on her escort team. Briefly, you can see me walking by, walking her up through the square. And there we were meeting with the, the leaders of Maidan and, and trying to find out that diplomatic discourse to occur between the protest leads, you know, Poroshenko, who would become the president, Klitschko, who would become the Kiev mayor, Tiani Bolk, Andrei Parubi, the, the kind of camp commandant of Euromaidan. So all that was, was attempting to be done to de-escalate this situation and to get to a point where the, 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 the desires of the Ukrainian people could be reasonably met 
understanding that you know wouldn't lead to Yanukovych signing the EU trade agreement the next day, but it also meant that Ukraine wouldn't join CSTO either and join the, the economic trade bloc with Russia and the former Soviet Union countries. So that was all kind of happening, de-escalating a bit. But then on February 18th, things changed again. Some of the right-wing groups, Pravi Sektor was one of the principal ones, and you'll still hear them today. And usually in reference to those are the Nazis in Ukraine, most of which is hyperbole. There's always a shred of truth to many claims, but Poravi Sektor was at the time seen as quite a radical group, small group. But if anyone was going to be calling for violence and committing violence, it was probably going to be Poravi <laughs> Sektor. And they had called for, what's the term that they use? It's like a, a, a peaceful, a peaceful offensive is what they called for on the 18th. And that day, no one was really scheduled to be down there. Like I said, Pravi Sector wasn't very big. They didn't represent like a majority representation on Maidan. Their leader didn't really have as big of a, a seat as any of the other leaders. So really didn't think that it would, it would blow up into much. And we were grossly wrong. About late morning, we saw clearly that this offensive was real. It wasn't so much sporadic numbered attacks here and there. It was an organized movement to increase the land, the, the secured space that the protesters held by at least double is, is what they were pushing into. And we started to see this unfold from news sources in the office. So we, we ran out the door, you know, dress shoes, slacks, and, and, and collared shirts and all. And fortunately I had a, a little kit I would keep there at the office. So I was able to put on some, you know, some kind of hiking shoes and, and jeans instead of the slacks, but we went out and I was teamed up and we were out there just doing, doing our same business of, of seeing what was going on and reporting it back. And we had pushed up into kind of the, the encirclement around the presidential administration building and the protesters were, they had secured up even past the presidential administration building a block behind it. So that was, it was quite surprising to see that they would, they would carry that much ground. So we had, we had pushed up into there and starting to look around, see what was going on. And we started to see a lot of protesters being pulled back, bloodied heads, holding their wounds, a lot of medics, volunteer medics running through the crowds, tending to, to various people. And it was pretty evident that it was, it was escalating once again, that, that violence was, was taking another seat and, and people had died already. Everyone who had been killed was, was through less than lethal rounds. And which was a, a prominent point we had to make in the embassy is a lot of people would start clamoring about uh, certain, you know, conspiracy theories that it was a sniper in the 32nd story building of a government building four blocks away who took the guy out. And we had to, to kind of quell those rumors immediately. Like, no, 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 no. If, if someone is shot, you will plainly know it. And there's another quote in that book that I mentioned that is quite a, quite a reference to that time with colorful language of words that was used as a safety brief, as far as I understand it for years to come, <laughs> but it's, it's readily apparent. And for those of us who've been in combat, when someone's shot with a bullet, I mean, it's entering your body and it's usually exiting and with it is coming massive amounts of blood to follow. And none of that was happening. And some of the people who were being shot were at point blank range with a shotgun and people were claiming that you know, this person was shot with a live round because he's dead. I'm like, well, if it was a live round at 10 feet away, you would definitely know it. But instead they were getting hit with these two ounce rubber slugs. It's going to depress into your sternum enough that it is essentially going to rupture your heart in the right spot. So they're less than lethal, not non-lethal. And there was a couple of people who had, who had been killed at that point, one of whom fell. One of the first to die was actually fell at my feet while I was observing. I have it on video where he attempted to jump off of the roof of a, the colonnade at the Dynamo Stadium and missed the tree and fell about 35 oh, feet wow. as the Bearcoot were chasing his comrades off the top of the colonnade. And then you can, it was live on CNN, it had a camera pointed right at it. And you can see the Bearcoot had tackled a guy on top of the colonnade and, and were beating him in the head until he was dead. And so this person who saw that happening, he had, I mean, what was he going to do? He going to go surrender the Barracoot who he just saw beat his friend to death or jump off into this tree that was not necessarily a tree, but more of a tall bush 
and missed the, 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 the main branch and unfortunately fell to his death. So I say that to say that, you know, their violence was still increasing. The lethality of that violence was increasing. I don't believe there were many, if any at all, deaths on the Ukrainian government side. Everything was very hush hush from the Ukrainian government. There was no information coming out on their side, but it was, it was still escalating a bit, but the overall demeanor on the, on the square had been diminishing until this day. So we were on those lines up there in the streets behind the presidential administration building and the whole office was out there and we were kind of taking on our own little areas of responsibility to kind of see what was going on. And I had noticed where I was standing at, there was a medical station and one of the volunteer medics was carrying forward a Ukrainian ministry of interior troop. And he, he didn't really look like a conscript per se, because he's a little bit older, but he wasn't a beer coot officer. He wasn't riot police. He was one of like the standard interior troops and no armor and uncovered head and, and people, protesters who were walking by were, were hitting him on the head as they walked by the station, just because he was essentially an enemy oh. combatant at that point. And it was, it was something I just, I couldn't sit there and watch, you know? As a diplomat, I am a, I am an observer. I am not a participant in any, by any means in what's going on. There was no way I could just stand there and just watch this happen. And undoubtedly it was, you could feel it in that immediate area. Things were probably going to escalate real quick. You know, there were videos of Ukrainians that were coming out where riot police were videoed beating people to death from like windows up high that the police didn't think anyone was watching them, but people were, there was a video of, they had abducted a, a leader in the tactical units on Maidan and had completely embarrassed him by letting him out of the bus completely naked and just shaming him and calling him names. And, and really there was a lot of aggression felt uh, arguably so by the Ukrainian protesters. So you could kind of sense that things were about to escalate and some actions would be taken against this interior troop that should not have. So. I decided to walk up. I told the medic, like, hey, I'm I'm a diplomat. I'm just here to make sure that what's about to happen to this person, to this interior troop, isn't violence. And we should get him back to, you know, his people. And the medic was like, Yeah, sure, take him. You know, like, yeah, but he's got more people to tend to. So here I am taking responsibility for this 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 person to try and get him back to safety. So I did the best I could to shield his head as I, I huddled with him and, and carried him about a block away to the nearest uh, Ukrainian security forces line. And he couldn't really speak. He he could move, but he was not capable of, of communication really. But it seemed he understood that I, and I was telling him like, hey, I'm here to help you. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm here to get you back to your people. In a you know, mumbling sense of like he understood. So I walk up to the Ukrainian line and I, I peek my head around real quick and I start waving my hand like, hey, I'm here. And just rap, 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 rap. They start shooting down the down the alleyway. And like, whoa, hold your fire. And these are less than lethals. You know, there's no live rounds ever observed on my on to this point. And I'm like, whoa, hold your fire, hold your fire. I've got one of your guys and I want to give him back to you. He's injured. And they're like, okay, show, show him. So I like wave his arm out. They can see like his jacket and then his shoulder. They can see the epaulette. And it's like, okay, that's, that's your uniform, right? Your guy. And it was a very tense moment because it was a narrow, like a narrow hallway, but kind of like a, you know, it's a big concrete building and a little cutout in concrete of just about the shape of a small delivery truck and about 12 feet deep. And I'm walking through this very exposed, trying to hand over this guy. And I've got four or five riot police with AKs with less than lethals and shotguns with less than lethals pointed at me in full kit and I'm trying to hand him over at the very tense moment, but was able to get him back to his folks and, and hopefully he made it out of there with no permanent damage. But yeah, that was another changing moment in the, the protest for sure on, on the 18th of January. Okay. Sounds like it. And then that was kind of like, wow, that was, that was quite a high moment in, in what had just happened. Adrenaline is running. Like I need to take a little breather. I link back up with my buddy that day and we're walking around and we like, Hey, let's, let's go ahead and head all the way to the other side of the presidential admin building to where the main market is. And let's just kind of see what's going on over there. Let's just have a nice little walk. It's a little, sounds a little quiet that way, but let's just, you know, cover all of our avenues here. We're like, okay. So we're just kind of walking nonchalantly and we get about a quarter mile down the road and there's really no one else on the, on the street. And all of a sudden on the left, 
out of an alleyway sprinting forward is a beer coot officer. And if you look at photos, a beer coot officer is very easy to identify because they have that bright blue kind of shark looking camouflage and the black helmets, you know, really black boots uh, with the, with the trousers tucked into them. So it's really easy to tell who they are. And they're usually built like Mike Allstott from the bucket here. It's <laughs> like they're refrigerators running around and this guy runs out and he sees us and in Russian, he's screaming like, you know, all the cuss words you can imagine and pointing right at us and saying, there they are, go get them. And not necessarily like at us, meaning like we're diplomats or Americans, but just they're like people are. <laughs> and noticeably, these guys don't have shields, only sticks. So it's pretty clear what their mission oh, well. is right now. It's not to hold a line and it's not to defend. It's to go on the offensive. So we see this. And immediately turn around and we are booking it. <laughs> and as soon, as soon as we turn around, I mean, it's a blur going down that street. I, I can't even tell you like how long we ran for, but it was an empty street. It was really just us down that far. Cause we were kind of in no man's land. The bear coot were obviously trying to sweep wide to bring in any protesters to you know, wrangle them into an area they wanted. So we were in kind of that really wide sweep and they probably didn't expect to see someone within like 20 feet of them when they came around that corner. So anyway, we book it and we start passing Ukrainians and a lot of them are kind of like the, the pensioners, the, the older people, they're not the active people who are kind of fighting and holding the line there. And we stop and uh, turn around and we see the barracuders still coming, but they're, they're not really in assault mode as much anymore. I think by the time they saw kind of who was on the street and what was going on, but also at the same time, there was really nowhere to go. So everyone is just kind of standing there in a courtyard of uh, a couple of apartment buildings and there's nowhere to go. Like we can't just walk into an apartment building. They're all sealed up and there's one little gate in the corner. I mean, uh, like a three foot by six foot tall gate. And that's the only way out of this thing. And there's probably 500 people packed into this courtyard. Mm. And we're standing there like, okay, what is about to happen? These Barracuda officers obviously don't want us on the street, but you know, there's no way that they're going to be you know, beating all these pensioners down. So we stand there and just wait to see what happens next. And luckily, it appeared that their mission was simply to corral everyone using a massive overwhelming force. And luckily for us, not violence at this time, to push everyone back. Because at that moment, you know, who knows whether or not screaming, I'm a diplomat and flashing our badge would have helped. <laughs> right. I mean, if anything, that may have even made it worse if their mission would have been to beat everyone out of there and we had nowhere to go. I mean, we're not going to be trampling over pensioners to get out of the courtyard. But then we we are marshaled out of, of that courtyard and the Barracuts keep their distance and they're just making sure that everyone's moving through the gate and they're keeping a healthy 50-foot you know, distance at that point. So we get out on the road. And then the beer cooter, they got water cannon trucks and riot police, and they're just simply ushering people down the road. And it's really clear at that point, there's, there's no way you're really going to fight against these guys right now. So, and there really is no more fighting at that point. It was quite a de-escalation by an overwhelming force that was not really too expected that day because it was some pretty fierce fighting on a kinetic level that day. But everyone was being ushered back down to the Maidan that day and pushed into the central part of the square. And, and then the sun started to set and that new normal day had concluded. Oh, what a day. You've really been through a yeah. lot during those protests and you weren't even a Ukrainian. It's incredible. Nope. no, nope. Yeah. So what you said earlier about the, the policeman who was injured, that, that actually brought up something I wanted to ask you. It, so far, it really seems like the Berkut and the other police are kind of these like implacable, you know, faceless stormtrooper types from, from what we've heard so far, but were there any of them that like defected or refused to take part in the beatings that you saw anything like that? I mean, these are Ukrainians versus Ukrainians, right? Yeah. So there were, there were a lot of reports coming out about that and I'll get to the rest of your question too, about the violence and, and the, the, the shootings as well. But yeah, so the bear coot are special forces, riot police organized by region within their various Depart or you know regional departments of the Ministry of Interior. So, in Kiev, the Berkut definitely yeah they're the enforcers, the stormtroopers. Their loyalty because uh, it's a pretty elite unit. And if you're in the Kiev Berkut unit, like you're pretty elite. So you know I think a lot of a lot of their loyalties were pretty well 
a seated. And I'm pretty sure I came face to face with some of them later on in Crimea hmm. the following month. But there were a lot of reports of like the Lviv Berkut units refused to go to Kiev. Sumy, Chernihiv, I think, I think are some of the other places that come to mind of kind of other like uh, typical Ukrainian, ethnic Ukrainian stronghold cities refuse to send the beer coot to Kiev because, you know, as all this is going on, the government is calling in any and all reinforcements it possibly can from the rest of the country. But, you know, a Simferopol, Sevastopol, Odessa, Kherson, a lot of those areas are sending beer coot troops. I and mean, there were some reports that officers were refusing, but you know, at the time, the Yanukovych government was the ruling power, had a, a certain grasp over media. So we weren't really hearing too much as like defections, but definitely whole units not really wanting to go was definitely being reported. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I didn't see much of that. I saw a lot of pleas like in the Winter on Fire documentary that you mentioned, a lot of heartfelt pleas to the, the police on the opposite side of the line there from the protesters, but not a lot of defections or anything like that. So I, I didn't expect that to have happened too much. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, important to remember is the bulk of the Ministry of Interior interior troops are largely conscripts. So you, know, you, you have to either go into the military or the interior troops as a conscript. And so that was the bulk of their force. So uh, a pretty small professional force of security officers on the Maidan, Birkut were the largest number you could see of let's call them professional troops security troops on Maidan the interior troops were just kind of holding the line and the reports that we got especially after the government fell from the interior troops was that they had no idea what was going on very similar to what we see today in some of the Russian troops in Ukraine is that these interior troops were in their barracks and scooped up you know weeks or months prior and told to get on a bus and their phone, if they had a smartphone, it was taken from them. And they were then put in the front line on my dawn, on shift every day. And they got no in, no access to information. The only information they had was the morning briefing from their commander. They didn't get to call anyone. They had no TV. So just like we see today where some of the Russian troops are told that you're going to denazify Ukraine and that's just full of drug users and, and murderers. <laughs> mm -hmm. The interior troops are being told the exact same thing. It's, it's Nazi is a term that is so easily used in in that part of the world as a, you know. It's an immediately a bad person. You just say that person's a Nazi. It requires no additional explanation mm -hmm. that you should hate that person and that person is evil. So that's the normal term that is thrown out. Like it was Nazis, fascists, and CIA. It was all a big CIA conspiracy and funded by the fascists and uh, the Nazis, the American Nazis to instill a puppet government. And that's what the interior troops are being told. They were being told that these fascists were murdering civilians in the streets and that they were the only thing that was standing between the parliament and the presidential administration building from burning and everyone being crucified. Hmm. You know, it's obviously propaganda and censorships have been, have been part of warfare and conflict for you know, centuries, if not millennia, but it's also amazing to think about the idea that the only way you can get your troops to enact your will is if you prevent them from learning anything else whatsoever about what's going on right now. That's a really amazing set of circumstances there. Yep. Yep. Security forces and militaries are there to exact the political will. And if the political will is what you say it is, then there's, there's no going apart from that. Yep. What a situation. So it does, it makes me feel a little bit more empathy for these interior troops that you mentioned, not so much a better could, but those guys were caught up in something that was beyond their control and didn't have much say in things. It sounds like at all. Yeah. But, but definitely the beer coot were a hundred percent complicit mm -hmm. and, and knowledgeable of what they were doing. Those events really, as I said earlier, you know, this was a war of attrition that was happening and everything was usually de-escalating to a point that it would likely fizzle out and concessions would be made up until the point that the Ukrainian government made horrible decisions. And this was another one of them where they pushed everyone down to the core part of Maidan Nizhelishnosti. And there are videos that you can see from those days, mainly of February 18th and the 19th, and then into the morning of the 20th, where, I mean, it was very depressing. You had government BTRs pushing up against the defenses. And earlier you had mentioned before we started that, that video 
of a BTR running up against a, a, a barricade and then probably a dozen Molotov cocktails being thrown on it as it backs away. You know, that was in those days. Oh, yeah, that's that intense. was in that corridor of middle of February. And it was, I mean, it, honestly, and we, it's funny, they're making the same reference today that they were then, that these are the orcs and this is Mordor and the fight uh, oh, for, really? you know, coming from... Yeah, from the Orcs of Mordor, and the Eye of Sauron is the government presidential administration building directing all the, the violence down <laughs> oh. on them. And it was scorched earth policy on the on the ground level. The Birkut and the security forces were burning anything and everything that they came in contact with. You know, the snow was largely melting at this time. As I said earlier, the ice is really what held a lot of the, the, the defenses together. Well, that was melting. That was dissipating. The ice wall was much lower. The BTRs were brought out to start disassembling. The barricades, as well as a couple dozen Barracoot officers, were pulling apart and cutting and, and using torches to cut apart the barricades and crushing everyone down to a center of Maidan. And over a couple of weeks was the dissipating population on Maidan and people understandably going back to their homes, some of which were not in uh, Kiev and some of whom probably didn't even live in Ukraine, maybe back to Poland or wherever they were working. But by about the 19th, um, oh, definitely on the, on the 19th, mid-morning, I was back out on observation and kind of another revitalized offensive had taken place. It seemed like there was a, another rallying of protesters to start pushing back. And this was, this was a day that it changed again. This was a day that we first saw weapons, actual firearms, and we saw them in the hands of the protesters. We saw shotguns. I personally inspected and, and held a, a Glock 19 to inspect from a protester who was bringing it in. He, he let me inspect it and to see like, yeah, this is real. Like this isn't a copy. It's not like a BB gun that looks like a Glock. Right. Like that's, that's chambered in nine millimeter. This would fire a real bullet. And then they showed me the ammunition that they were using. And it, it, it wasn't a full blank round that you normally see a crimped tip mm -hmm. on, but it had a, like a white cardboard front to it. So if anything, it, it may be, and I'm not too familiar with what uh movie production rounds may look like, but it may have been one of those where it was just enough powder to cycle the action and the, the cardboard front was just enough to keep that pressure mm. up with no real projectile other than the gas mm. is what it looked to be. And we started making those observations. We started seeing the shotguns come out. So there was some mention. People have said they'd used words that made it sound like it was birdshot they were firing. It definitely wasn't buckshot or slugs. Otherwise, we would have seen dead Ukrainian security officers that they were shooting at. But we were standing right there watching all of this happen as it started to unfold. And that was one of the moments, you know, you'd asked earlier, like, where, where, so where do you guys go? Like, where's the line of advance? Like any no-go areas. And that was one of them. Once we saw that, that hit for us a tripwire that, okay, we probably shouldn't be standing here anymore. We probably were not getting the observations out of this that are worth the risk. We can watch this on CNN. Mm -hmm. So we backed out. And, and started watching from afar and watching everything unfold, just like everyone else around the world was at that time on TV. But there was still some presence the following day, the day of infamy here of February 20th, which was Bloody Thursday. And that was the day that weapons were issued live, you know, uh, live ammunition, capable weapons with live ammunition was issued. It's when you see the videos and the, the pictures of Ukrainian security forces in black uniforms with a yellow armband. There's a lot of opining as to who those members are. A lot of the consensus that you see in news sources and investigative journalists point to a few different agencies and entities, but it, it did not appear to be the Birkut. The Birkut were, were observed in the area, but they were in their normal blue uniforms and they were not the ones that we saw up on the front in black and yellow. Hmm. And in the book that I referenced earlier, there's passages that describe this activity again. And Mike was out on duty that day, the Marine attache, and he was the one that was down there watching all this unfold and reporting on it. You know, he was down on the ground when the shots were first fired. And when they were fired, he immediately recognized those are live rounds. Started reporting that up. And then started seeing all the casualties come in. He was hanging out at the med center and started seeing the bodies being brought in. 
the the surgeon there let him be in the room and kind of observe all this that was happening to get the word out. And you know, Mike was observing the wounds and the exit wounds were all on the front side of the bodies. So, and that coincided with some footage as well as testimony from later on that we all saw that the first protesters shot with live ammo were shot in the back running away. Oh, man. And it goes in, in pretty good detail in that book uh, of the events that unfolded there with those protesters. And it was really just an unsavory action to take on, you know, shooting, shooting unarmed civilians in the back who are running away from you. It's incredible. Um, quite a decision to make. And this was, this was more than one shooter, right? Like this was an activity. It was not a, like, oh. there were, there were multiple armed, armed people with live ammunition firing at civilians. Mm -hmm. You know, how many were actually shooting, you know, probably at least five to six, but there were dozens of observed mm. armed, armed people and the winter on fire. You can see that footage of what seems to be, and there's pictures at October palace at the top of the street there, in the yellow theater, there's a, what seems to be an officer laying down with an SVD rifle and, and sending rounds down at the protesters and dropping protesters. And we're all watching this unfold, you know, just like everyone else is live on TV. Our observer, Mike, is just in the med center away from the, the act of fighting. And to watch the, the heavenly 100, as they're ref, uh, referred to now, the heavenly Sotnia, march up that street, being shot at by sniper rounds. Like, like it's not just random fire as you're running from cover to cover. You're sitting there exposed, able to be shot at any moment. And your friend is shot right next to you, falling over immediately. And you don't run. You don't scream. You don't panic and, and, and retrograde or retreat. These were people who were picking up their buddies to their left and their right, rendering aid, getting them back to the medical station while other members continued assaulting forward and upwards towards the shooters with no weapons. They had no weapons. They had no armor that could stop any of the rounds being used against them. And that bravery, I mean, that'll live with me and, and many of us forever. And that's, that's the moment when it came off the rails irreversibly for the Yanukovych government. Yeah. Their loss was not in vain. That, that was very clear. And the footage that you're, you're talking about, like I said, I just watched it a few days ago and it's, it's, it's really awful to see people just very, very clearly from a few feet away They're they're bleeding to death right there on the sidewalk, you know, surrounded by their, their friends who are also in the same situation. And it's, I mean, you see yeah. the life go out of them right there on the sidewalk and it, it's terrible. Yeah. So really something. Yeah, it really is. But, but like you said, um, that was, that was the true turning point, right? It was, I mean, that was the. That was the final nail in the Yanukovych regime. And he probably knew it. There's a couple other stories I'm very excited to be able to tell when, when I do get a publication review through. But what I can say is that it was, it was a mad dash for anyone who was substantially supporting the Yanukovych regime to get out of country. There were watchdog organizations, satellite imagery companies that were updating on at Gostumel Airport, Giuliani Airport, those are two airports that are not the international airport for Kyiv, but mainly held private aircraft. And they were watching dozens of private aircraft leave the country, some of which was, was coming in and out to cycle, understandably, you know, people's possessions as they're fleeing the country, but also just a, a flight of leadership and power in the country that was the party of regions power. And we got about two days of very somber, very dark mood in Kyiv. That night, right in front of our apartment, our apartment sat on the Shevchenko Square, one of the principal squares across from the, the, the main university in Kyiv. And there was a candlelight vigil and extremely emotional. It was palpable to feel it in the square as it's just utter silence. And this candlelight vigil is being held. And the mood of the town is, is, is definitely in mourning, but not given up, not without resolve and not without motivation. Yeah. And the protesters hold their lines as 
the government retreats. They realize that shooting indiscriminately into civilian crowds is not going to win this. So we saw videos and reports of them all falling back to their positions, the stronghold at the presidential administration building and the parliamentary building. And negotiations began. The German foreign minister came in, EU minister came in, and negotiations started with Yanukovych and the leaders of the, the Maidan revolution. And it was apparent that they not unsure how Yanukovych was going to survive this at all as a regime. And then the next day, I believe it was that Saturday, we come out in the morning, I walk my dog and I start heading out down to the square and I hear reports of people saying like, they're gone. They're just gone. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like the government, the government's just gone. And the protesters early in the morning kind of noticed that there were no more police. There were no more interior troops. There were no more barracoot. There were no positions being held. A group of protesters cautiously walked up to the presidential administration building, grabbed the handle of the door, pulled it, and it opened. Wow. It's unlocked, unguarded, walked through the building. It was deserted. There was nobody there. Word quickly began to spread that the government had essentially fallen. And we all went into the office. We were all recalled into the embassy. And we turned on the TV and we were watching in real time the remaining parliamentary members. Most of the party regions members were, were absent, but the parliament stood up and had declared that the president was vacant and had vacated his seat and incapable of leading. And minute by minute, they were passing resolutions mm. that were bringing an end to this revolution and instituting the new government. And this was happening so fast. And we saw the votes come in of establishing the, the defense council or the, the security council chair as the interim president, the resolution to establish the new foreign minister, the new minister of defense, all the ministerial positions, establishing the follow on elections that would take place. And for that day, walking around in Kyiv was just an utter sense of relief. What had the night before been a tearful candlelight vigil, the next day was almost like this sense of blossoming flowers, mm. of, of rejoicing, of spring coming forward and cheerfulness. People were happy. People were, were for the first time, not cautiously talking about what was happening in their city, in their country. And it felt really good to appear to be done with this and completely and utterly surprising the next day if not i think that night the little green men showed up in crimea and that that mission of just watching a revolution or protest turning into a revolution to a government in transition very quickly turned into a situation that looked like an invasion and a attempted coup of the autonomous Republic of Crimea that ultimately, as we see today, was successful in Russia annexing it, but not being obviously observed by the US or Ukraine at all. And our mission completely changed. And it was pretty apparent after that day that this was Russia. And the Russians had just invaded Ukraine. And we got only a few hours to comprehend what had just happened with the finishing of a revolution. Such an incredible whirlwind there. I mean, the, for the whole world, but for you guys on the ground, for the Ukrainian people, just, you know, vindicated just hours before. And, and then the whole situation turns on a dime again. It was shocking for everyone. And, and I would imagine for you guys as well. Was there any warning or any indication that this kind of thing might happen that you recall? Or, or was everyone just as, as blown away throughout the U.S. government as well? Well, you know, you know, personally, I had... I would have never guessed if, if you would have played a game with me to guess the future and 25 different scenarios, I would have never with money on the line ever chosen that Russia was going to invade Crimea and begin supporting and standing up separatist regions in Eastern Ukraine. Never, <laughs> you know, and I can't really comment on 
whether or not the the government as a whole or the intelligence community was surprised. Sure, of course. But there's plenty of, I think, Senate and congressional public hearings to that matter. At the time, now infamous director, DIA director Flynn, I believe gave testimony. But yeah, to me at least, certainly I can say that it was not something I expected. But it makes sense once you look at what's going on, you know, that Crimea is is such a central identity piece to what Putin believes is Russia. And then militarily also, I mean, Sevastopol is the only natural harbor in the entire Black Sea, meaning it has a natural land feature that completely protects it from the waters of the sea in a, in a natural mm -hmm. harbor. So the Black Sea fleet is headquartered in Sevastopol. They had 10,000, a treaty at least, to allow for 10,000 Russian troops on the Crimean Peninsula legally. Who knows exactly how many they had on the peninsula when this happened, mm -hmm. but they were already there. They didn't have to necessarily invade. Oh, I see. To Russia, the invasion of Crimea was simply walking off base. Okay, okay. But that's what they did. So were they... Yes. I guess... What... And, and, Putin, and Putin admitted to it later mm -hmm. on. You know, for weeks and weeks, it was just the little green men. It was people in the very newly released digital camouflage uniforms of the Russian military, but showing up in Ukraine with a person in a balaclava looking very much like a Kazakhstan heritage in his family. It was like, you look like you'd be a Russian soldier, not like a Ukrainian, mm -hmm. which is who they were purporting to be. These little green men in masks were purporting to be Ukrainian nationalists and who were there to prevent the spread of fascism to Crimea. And Putin publicly stated in the press that he was asked about these little green men in Crimea. He's like, oh, they, I don't know, but they look like terrorists to me. They should really do something about that over there. <laughs> he, um, he had the audacity to make those statements. Wow. And what were actually Russian troops on the ground. And later on, years later, he was, Putin was interviewed again, where he admitted he was called out for that. It's like, hey, you know, years ago, you said this. You said that these were not Russian troops. You said that they were terrorists. He's like, oh, yeah, but they were. I lied. I know but they're, they're <laughs> Russians. I know, oh, wow. but we had to, it was, a, it was a special military operation. Sure. So at the embassy, you, you said, I guess you guys had to pivot to face this new situation immediately. So I think earlier you mentioned that you yourself went to Crimea. So on the border being the partnership for peace program chief in Ukraine, I had, and I'd already been there for almost three years when this Russian invasion started. So I had arguably the most contacts in the entire Ukrainian military, whether it be the army or the Navy. I didn't really have many contacts in the Air Force, but they weren't really any of the units that we were seeing involved in this. So I assembled onto a team with, with a colleague and we went out in the middle of March and with a target date of being on and around the gateway, at least to the peninsula on the 16th of March, which was the referendum date where a shockingly amount of, I believe it was somewhere around 110% voter turnout. So that's amazing. Wow. Well, I'm here. That many people came out. Yeah. That many cr amount of Crimeans came out to vote for their decision to join the Russian Federation with over 80% of overwhelming support, which is the number shockingly that Yanukovych used in his <laughs> conversations with Ambassador Teft as to the magic number that you would believe is could, could only be a legitimate winning election number. Hmm. So yeah, we were, we were down in, in that area. Artemyansk is the town and the name of the port of entry between mainland Ukraine and Crimea on the West, and then Changar on the East side. And then there's, there's a, a land bridge that goes down pretty far. It's called Sturkovia on the East side. If you've got a map, it's a very narrow, you can run in about 30 seconds between the beach on either side of it. It's, it's a pretty narrow land strip in, in, in certain places. Henichevsk is the uh, name of the bridge that was actually destroyed very recently. And my roots in the Marine Corps actually as a combat engineer first before I came over into counterintelligence and human intelligence. And as a combat engineer, we, we plant explosives, we blow up bridges, we set mines, we demine, all that kind of stuff. And there's a Ukrainian combat engineer who was in the process of setting explosives on that bridge. And the Henichevsk bridge is quite a large bridge and you can get a significant amount of equipment through there. And it's one of the major arterial routes that you can move material from Crimea to mainland. 
So understandably, the Ukrainians were, were getting ready to, to dispatch of it. And this combat engineer was underneath it and could not get away. The Russians were on top of him as they were there. He blew it while sitting in the middle of it mm. and brought it down. So, I mean, that just shows the bravery of what, what the, the Ukrainians are going through there. It really does. But yeah, so we were there on that day, driving around those areas, those corridors, just observing the, the activities that were happening. We had heard that there was some activity on Strokovia. So we went across the Henichesk Bridge and drove on down and we were met by a Ukrainian military and they greeted us and said, oh, hey, are you guys here to see the Chad? And the Chad is the chief of defense, which is the analog to our joint chiefs of staff. And we're like, no, <laughs> but is he here? <laughs> And, you know, and we know him like as, as diplomats and, and, and part of the attache corps, like, you know, these people. So like the chief of defense is a known person and he'll know us by name. Maybe not me, but the colleague that I was with, they knew one another. And apparently he was flying in on helicopter. So we wait there and the chief of defense lands and his little PSD goes out, secures the area. He comes on out and we had a nice little chat with them for a while and gave us a little you know, assurances and, and pleased with the support of the U.S. government during these times. And then we went on our way. And part of that way was just kind of seeing what it looked like between what was all of Ukraine, but now administratively from the perspective of Russia being set up as a border, a Russian border. And yeah, during the events of that day, spare the details here, but I uh, was greeted not so friendly way from a Birkut officer who had obviously seemed to have been one of the ones who fled Kiev and was now aiding the Russian border guard service and the Russian FSB secure the border to Crimea. Luckily, our exchange ended in me not being filled with holes, <laughs> but yeah, that was quite, quite a crazy day. I can't really get into a lot of the details, but you know, it was a, a definite change in the scope of our mission. And for a lot of the other events that happen the rest of the year, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to get into because they're not as widely covered as the revolution, but. Sure. Well, I mean, I look forward to hearing about it eventually. Like you mentioned, it, it sounds like you are planning a book eventually, right? Have you started writing anything about your experiences yet? I've got, I've got some writings, nothing that looks like even a draft manuscript as of yet. Life is always seeming to trump the priority list of writing this book, but. I was very pleased when I heard that my, my friend Chris had published a book on this because he covers, and for all your listeners who want to get a, a very detailed look into what was going on leading up to, including and after the Ukrainian revolution, I highly recommend reading Chris's book, Ukraine's Revolt, Russia's Revenge, because he provides a lot of this information and he has quotes from our, the email traffic that was happening at the time that, you know, obviously would have went through a review from the department of state prior to, to publishing. So I'm glad that he came out with that. Cause that means if I'm writing a book, I don't have to cover the same <laughs> things he did. So I, I can write on those coattails per se and, and cover a little bit more down on the military stuff. So yeah, I'll be looking to doing that here in the near future of going through the painstaking process of, of FOIA to get to some of the reports out that I can use for substantiating research and go through the lovely process of pre-publication review. Good, good. So how much longer were you in Ukraine after all of this occurred? So I was there until September and got extended twice overall while I was there. I wanted to keep staying. My wife would probably have killed me if we would have stayed even another couple of weeks. She was done. I was essentially a, an absentee father to my infant mm. son, who at that point in September, I mean, he was born in September 2013. So he was almost a year old and we'd able, I was able to actually get away during all this in June. I'd left for five days to go to Barcelona. It was the best trip I'd ever taken. It was with such relief to just go and unwind for a few days, but it was, it was a grueling summer. And it was grueling and exhausting until the very last night. I was actively working, actively communicating, and actively res responding that night that I left. Yeah. I think I left the embassy 
at about 1130 or midnight, closed it all down for the last time, drove home, and the embassy driver was picking us up at, I think, about 2.15 in the morning. Oh, my gosh. To take us to the airport. So I got home and had about an hour and a half to finish packing up the last little carry-on bags and get a little bit of food and drink in me and, and pick up the family and, and head on to the airport and come home. Hmm. Quite an op-tempo there, but with so much going on, it sounds like you were a, a very critical part of the operations there the entire time. Yeah, it really felt, like I said earlier, it was the best time of my life before the revolution, during the revolution, and after, during the Russian invasion. Some of the best connections and, and friendships I've made uh, in my life are the other embassy and, and military staff members that I worked with in the U.S. Embassy there. We still communicate to this day. And it was quite quite an emotional time to leave, for sure. Well, Especially like all the Ukrainians that were left behind to continue fighting the fight. Have you had the chance or have you had the desire even to, to go back since then to Ukraine? I mean, yeah, I've wanted to. We've talked it over as a family that it's something that sounds like it would be good from her perspective to like go back and visit, but definitely not really to work. Right. I don't think, I don't think that's really in the cards. So I did go right back out in the region right afterwards to the Republic of Georgia. I did get to go back to Ukraine while I was there for exercise sea breeze and, and got to you know sit down with the Ukrainian Marines for a couple of days and listen to some of their stories. So that's that's a, the last time that I saw any of those guys, though, uh, or talked to any of them. So, well, it sounds like you um, left on a high mark in a way. I mean, it sounds like you left with your head held high and having accomplished quite a bit. Yep, yep. I hope so. I hope that's the perspective left behind for sure. Good. So, are you out of the Marine Corps now? Like, what are you doing with yourself these days? Yeah. So, I I mean, I left I left active duty in June of 2016. I have remained employed by the Department of Defense going on 20 years now. Yeah, I, I remain remain employed. <laughs> okay, that's a good place to be for sure. Yeah. Shane, thank you so much. This has been incredibly enlightening. Of course, you, Ukraine is on everybody's minds these days, and it's really wonderful to get a perspective on some of the events that led to where we are right now. And I, I really appreciate the firsthand perspective. It sounds like there was a, a short time period there when you were one of the maybe three or four Americans that knew more about what was going on in Ukraine than anyone in the world. Honestly, if you were right there to see it with your own eyes. So I'm, I'm glad that yeah. you had the chance to come and talk to us about it today. Yeah, of course. No, thank you very much for having me. All right. And I'm glad that this is important to people still. It, it definitely is. And let me know if your book is published in the near future. And I will, I'm sure that a lot of my listeners and uh, readers will want to pick up a copy of that as well once it's out. All right. Thanks, Shane. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long-form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Jack T. and William M., with your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.